it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce um, one of the most iconic and respected journalists and broadcasters um, of all time. And we're honoured to have him here opening the Media Summit for us this year, Sir Trevor MacDonald. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I've done many things before. I'm not too sure I've ever been trusted with opening a media summit. Um, and I was fascinated by the, uh, the, your, your, the bit of entertainment that you, <laughs> you had there. I like the, I liked the music and, and the, uh, seeing people with uh, all the signs around them rem um, reminded me what I was talking to you about. I've just done a film in America. Um, uh, at a maximum security prison, so I, I know those things very well. And, uh, I, I may say all the people there were here were much more charming, and I'm sure um, much better. It's it's a very um, it's not always easy to talk uh, to people about the media, especially if um, I've been in this game for such a long time, and and you were just about to enter. And the times change, and it's really very difficult to make that transference from uh, the, the stage at which I enter the, the, the industry to the stage at which you, you, you are hoping. I take it that many of you here are in some branches of the media and that some of you are interested in the journalistic side, which is, which is the side I know a, li a little about. Um, uh, the, it wouldn't surprise you to learn that I, I think, and you've obviously heard, that uh, this subject of journalism on that side of the media is immensely controversial, es es especially now. Um, uh, we have not always had a great reputation, journalists, um, and people keep telling us that. At one time, I remember reading something which suggested that we ranked below politicians and estate agents. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember reading some time ago Leonard Wolf, who was the husband of Virginia Wolf, um, and no doubt uh, a little puzzled by how successful she was and the fact that he never became as successful, sort of wrote an impassioned letter to a friend. Um, he, he was also a friend of John Maynard Keynes. And uh, so he was in living in, you know, with Virginia Woolf and John Maynard Keynes in very exalted company. And his side of the fence wasn't going as well. And he wrote this rather impassioned letter saying, you know, I've, I've tried everything. I've tried to be an author. I've tried to be an editor. I've tried to be an academic. I've tried to be a historian. He said, and now I've sunk to the lowest level, journalism. And, and that was not a, a, a view which was, uh, which was, you know, very uncommon. And I always remember uh, many, many years ago to find this encapsulated in the experience I had in America when I was following around the Reverend Jesse Jackson on an American presidential campaign. And Jesse Jackson was the most wonderful politician to follow. His speeches were sensational. They were great. It, they had that, that, those sort of rolling cadences of the Southern Baptist Church. And everything he said was invigorating. And you sat there and you applauded. You didn't agree very much with any policies, or you never thought they could ever come true. But you sat there and you applauded. And they were absolutely wonderful. And I, tr I went to almost all his speeches. And I went to listen to him at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And the problem came between the relationship between Jackson and the press came when we began to realize that he had not the slightest chance of ever becoming president. Um, that in itself was fine. Uh, the real problem came when he knew what we knew and didn't like it very much. And we began saying so. so and, and he told a story to illustrate just how untrustworthy journalists are and how we lack integrity, we lack common decency, we lack anything to do with truth and honesty. And he, t he told the story, he said, at the end of a long day's campaigning, I was walking along the banks of the Mississippi. He said, and on the far, far side of the river, I could see that there was a problem. He said, when I looked much more closely, I could just about discern what the problem was. And, and when I looked you know, into it even more closely, I could see that there was a sort of mother and child in some sort of trouble. So you see, so I looked around to see who could help me get across the river. There were none of the boats. There was nobody to take me across. So he said, I decided as a public-spirited citizen to take matters into my own hands. So he said, I walked across the water from one side of the river to the other. And I helped this mother and child. And, and uh, 
mother was relieved and I, they were all very happy at the end of it. And so. He said, then I walked back across the water, he said. And I went back to my hotel room and waited to see what you guys would write the following day about what I did. And he said, of course, it was confirmed. You have no honesty, no decency, no integrity. The headlines in bold letters said, Jesse Jackson can't swim. <laughs> and, and it was, it was his, his view about what we do. So that is, that is how we are seen. And yet, I think that the careers that you have chosen, that I hope you will choose, I think, because of my experience, is one of the most important things you can do in a democratic society. I mean, I'll come back to this a bit later. But I think, quite basically, we are the interface between the executive and the people who are governed. In other words, between the people and the executive. And I think if our job is done properly, we have a grave, grave responsibility of letting people know what's being done in their name. I think it's as simple as that. That may sound too philosophically grand for some of the things that you see journalists do, but at heart, that is what it's about. And that is what we tell the people to whom we advertise our democratic system in Iraq and Afghanistan and wherever. We tell them, be like us. We have this democratic accountability. We have freedom of the press. We can report about what happens uh, in, in government to the people who are governed. And that is an essential part of, of the, way, the way in which we live. I became interested in it from a very young age. But I think one of the things that I've always felt was a determining factor in what I did was that I always had a genuine interest and a passion for this business of the dissemination of information. I can't explain in any kind of quasi-philosophical terms where that came from. But I'm not too sure that you can do it unless you have that desire. You must want to tell stories. You must want to communicate. You must be interested basically in the business. Of, if you're not, then it's a tough, it's a tough road. If you are, it's, not, it's still tough, but it, it means that you at least have the passion to do it, you want to do it, and you will find a, a, a way to do it. I began in Trinidad in the West Indies where I was born. I worked in radio, I wrote for newspapers, and um, I was born so long ago. The television had only just come in in Trinidad in those days, and I did some stuff on television as well. But I always, I, I always wanted um, uh, 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 to work in a bigger pond, as it were. And I mean, my parents were very ambitious for me, and they, they wanted me to, to do well, although I don't think they really wanted me to leave the country. But, um, but uh, I, I you know, was fevered up by, by that desire to do better in a bigger place. And so one of the places to, to which everybody aspired, because we listened to it all the time, was the BBC and the BBC World Service. And I suppose, much to my parents' uh, 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 chagrin, I decided to, to make a life in, in London. I was offered a job in London. To work at the BBC World Service was sensational. It has an amazing reputation. Even when I went on to work at ITN, I would still be, you know, I would still be aware of the great, great reputation. I was once covering a siege um, by Moroccan gunmen in The Hague many, many, many years ago. And I was talking to one of the Dutch press officers and saying, you know, why do you have these restrictions and where we can go and what we can do? He says, because the gunmen are all listening to the BBC World Service. And they know exactly what we're doing. And if I tell you and you say, it, it all goes, it all so broad guns. It was, a, it was just a reminder to me about the great power that that, um, that, that, that medium has. Um, I don't know what's happening to it now because there, there have been some changes. But it's, it's always had a, a, a great reputation. And then because I had done uh, some television in the West Indies, I wanted to, and I bored my friends at the BBC about what a brilliant television person I was. They, I, they, they said, if you think you're so good, why don't you apply to this, this, this new place called ITN? Why don't you, why don't you go? And I, I turned up there, and I remembered very well 
On the way to the interview, I stopped in at a bookshop on the way to Wells Street, and I bought a novel because I thought, I know these guys, they keep you sitting around for hours, and I can't bear not to have something to read. Um, so I bought this. I, I, I turned up. I didn't get to the first page. I was asked in for an interview. And to cut the long story short, I was given an audition. And I was, much to my consternation, I was, I was offered a job. I, I must just make one sort of digression here, which is that I, I was very suspicious about why I was being offered this job. I. I really didn't think I was that good. <laughs> and um, and I, it, it, I, I tell the story because it informs much of what I did in, in my career. Um, th th there weren't any black national broadcasters on te in television journalism. And uh, although I didn't realize it at the time, I, I was going to be the first. I said I didn't realize it because I was probably a bit naive and I only Somebody called up the following day and said, I want to take my picture. And I said, but why? And, and he said, and I, so I then said to my colleague, I said, some guy from the Daily Mail calls, I want to take my picture, you know. Uh, what, what, what's, what's going on? And he said, don't be so bloody stupid. Don't you, don't you understand what's, ha what's happening? You, you are, you, you know, you, you have crossed a, 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 a barrier. Um, so I, I wanted to make absolutely sure that I got a chance to do what I wanted to do. And if I could give you any kind of advice at all, it is that although there is an appearance today in the media that you have a multiplicity of choices, it is not always that simple. However, even if you are faced with a range of choices and you are kind of propelled into doing a variety of things, which is probably a very good idea, because you try your hand at many things, and you're not you know, pushed into one column. E even if that happens, I think you should always keep firm your determination in what you want to do. Um, I love sport. I had one problem with it. I found it much too easy. I loved it. I mean, I could do it with my eyes closed. I, covered cricket tours in Australia and uh, World Cups in Argentina. I mean, what a, what a great life. I could, but I found it a little too easy. Um, and I didn't think sport, although I spent most of my life now watching the thing, I didn't think it was the totality of what a life experience could be about. I, I, think, I thought there was a little more to life than football. And I wanted to be involved with that other part of life. For me, it was my interest in international politics. So I insisted on doing the political stories of the day. Um, I was sent to Northern Ireland. And in a way, that was the making of me. Because Northern Ireland, believe it or not, was uh, perhaps long before you were born. <laughs> uh, it, it was the, on the news every night. It was what they were called the Troubles, and people were killing and shooting each other every day. And there were bombs for um, a boy who grew up in the West Indies. This was all very strange. We had our fights and so on. But they were usually settled after uh, drinking bouts in the rum shop with machetes and, um, and, and, and wooden clubs and so on. But, uh, but, but to, to hear people being, to see people being blown up and to go as I did several times to scenes where soldiers had been blown up and to find, you know, turned up one morning a little too early before the place had been cleaned up and to see sort of bits of bodies hanging off trees was not a very kind of West Indian experience that I knew anything about. So it, it, it was all, it was all very new. But this is what I chose to do as against going to Argentina to cover the World Cup. Uh, um, and, and that was my determination. And so it led on to, uh, uh, so, so I mean, before I go on, let me just say, so that's, uh, I'm told I should give you advice, which is, uh, I'm not too sure I can, but that, that I would say is, is important. Make sure you do what you want to do, or make sure you try to do what you want to do, and don't be pushed into a channel because it is convenient to your employer. You must um, help your employers, and you must help them in their conveniences, but, but keep firm, a firm hold on what your 
ambition, your aspiration, your determination is to do, to do what you want to do. And so that took me quite naturally on to, it was the days when Britain was getting into the, what was then called the common market, now the EU, and I was sent to cover a lot of these things in Strasbourg and in Brussels and in Luxembourg. And the wonderful thing about the EU is that it's so wonderful it has so many capitals and one gets a chance to go to them all if you're covering these things. Uh, uh, the other, I, I think I drew one lesson too from covering those, um, those summit meetings. If you think about it, there are now, I forget how many nations there are in the EU, but they all, they all go to these summit meetings. If you go with the British delegation, you fly on the British plane, you are with the, you know, I'm from England, you, you with the British delegation. I always tried, and, and you, you get the British delegation's view of what happened at the meeting. It's the most natural thing. There was a briefing for journalists, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's spokesman would come and t t tell us what happened. I always made it my business to try and find out what the Germans were thinking. And I always went to the French briefing, and the Irish were always very nice to me, and they were always talked as well. You can't find out what's going on at an international meeting by talking to one side. They, they tell you their side. They, they're not necessarily lying. They're not dissimulating. They're not trying to, um, to, to, to delude you into believing one particular thing is against the other. It is one side out of 15. You have to try to discover what the general mood of the meeting is. You have to work to find out what, what the others think. You can't trust one source. It, didn't, it did annoy the uh, uh, British delegation when they discovered I was talking to the Irish and the Germans and the French, but I, I thought that I, I learned so much more about the other views about, about what was going on. And I, I think that's desperately important. And I, I, what I would say is that no one side has the story. And the great fun of journalism, the great, the thrill of it all is to try and drill down to find out the truth of what's really going on by talking to a variety of people. It requires a lot of legwork, it requires hard work, but in the end it pays off. And I've also found that nothing is, is, is better than actually going, and I know this is difficult these days because there are, we should probably come to this later, I mean there are cutbacks in all phases of the media, but nothing, nothing is as good as actually getting to the scene of where things are happening. I was terribly lucky. I went to summits in Moscow and in Washington and so on, and was able to talk to a variety of people. And you, you get so much from talking to the Russian delegate over several glasses of vodka in a bar in, in, in Moscow, especially when you bought the vodka. Uh, 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 the Russians were never very good at buying themselves, <laughs> although extremely hospitable, but um, you, 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 you can never find out as much from anything you've read, anything you've heard, but actually talking to people. And I know that what I say now sounds terribly, terribly grand because I had the luck of meeting these people. But I, before the first Gulf War, I went to Iraq to, uh, to interview um, Saddam Hussein. And what, what was interesting about that was not really so much the interview, at, at all really. I mean, I remember almost nothing about the interview. I, I remember, uh, I remember he, he was a very good interlocutor and he, I thought he tried to answer, quest to answer questions fairly, um, fairly. I didn't agree with what he said, but I thought he was a very good interviewee um, and, and uh, didn't understand very much English, but I thought he understood some and, and I thought he was very good. Um, what was fascinating is what I learned about Iraq from observing the choreography of the whole thing. There were half a dozen people from his inner cabinet, if one can use that word about Iraqi politics, um, uh, sitting in on this interview. And I had prepared myself very well for this interview and got very uptight about it and actually for the first time in my life, um, took downers to calm me down and so on. And, and, uh, 
and to make sure I can, could sleep and, and, and so on, because th this was supposed to be a, a, a big interview. And it was slightly discomforting in this wonderful golden palace, uh, you know, with all chairs, with bits of gold and so on, to, to, to find, you know, to be sitting there with, I had an interpreter, he had two interpreters, and then to have about a dozen people around. And I actually lost my temper, which I shouldn't, you should never do. Um, especially in the presence of the Iraqi president. But, um, and I said to these guys, you know, in, in, not, not to put too fine a point in it, I said, what the hell are you guys doing here? I mean, don't you have anything else to do? Um, and, 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 uh, and they didn't respond. But at the end of it, one of the guys came up to me and he said, you don't really understand anything about what's going on here, do you? And I said, I, I consider that a grave insult. I understand perfectly what's going on here. I've come to do an interview with your president. What's he said, no, but you don't understand what's going on. He said, we never, ever see a situation where he's asked any questions and where he's ever made to answer anything. And immediately, I mean, if you're like me, you, you got a sort of image of what the way that politics was set up. Nobody ever challenged the president. Nobody ever dissented from the presidential view, what he said went. And nobody ever saw him being questioned. There used to be a joke going around in Baghdad at the time I was there, which is probably apocryphal, but most journalistic jokes are apocryphal, but they're better for that. They're, um, that you know, the president would say to his prime minister, Tariq Aziz, Tariq, what's the time? And Tariq would say, Mr. President, what time would you like it to be? And, <laughs> And that was the way, that was the way the politics of Iraq won. So one, you learned much, much more from, from just that scene than almost anything he said. At the end of this interview, half a dozen of the people from the Ministry of Information came back to my hotel and finished off my 40 ounce bottle of scotch. And, um, and I, what, 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 you know, they all came and they were saying, you know, how was it? And I was so obsessed by this interview. I kept saying, well, you know, the quest, I thought the, I didn't ask this, or I thought his answers was, and they, they were dumbfounded. They were asking me, what was he like? They had never met him. They would never meet him. They were never in the same room with him. They were probably never in the same part of the city as, as the president was. So that the other thing you learned was that this guy didn't sort of walk down the high street shaking hands with people every day. And even those who worked for him in, in close quarters didn't really know what he was like. It was a closed, fairly kind of despotic, kind of ter terribly run regime. And I felt that in that kind of isolation were the seeds of its own demise. That was the Im Im impression I got. And I thought it was almost sort of kind of inevitable that it would end as, as it did. Because in the diplomatic world today, as reporters, I hope you would be, you'll discover, people talk to each other every day. You know, there's a guy who used to work in Downing Street for John Major who said to me, he picks up a phone on, in Downing Street and gets straight through to National Security Office in Washington. You, you, you talk to people every day. Nobody talked to Saddam, so he went nowhere, he saw no one. And in the end, the regime, if you want to look at it in kind of quasi-psychological terms, was almost crippled by its own isolation. And, uh, and so many, all the, all the other material consequences which flowed from that, I think, can be traced to that kind of isolation. I remember I formed a, a, a slightly different impression of Gaddafi when I met him some years later. Uh, um, I, I thought he was a showman of monumental uh, uh, um, um, proportions. He, he, um, we had set up, television can be fairly boring, as you know, and if somebody's going to come through that door, we think we are absolutely great sort of artistic directors, and we set up a camera to pitch a person coming through that door. Uh, great, you know. Um, and, and so we did, you know. We thought there was a pathway, and we thought he'd come through that pathway and so on. And then after about 15 minutes, I was aware that we were in a place where they, he did the interviews in his multicolored tent and surrounded by shrubbery. And I was aware there was sort of some movement in the, in the grass and so on. It was sort of 
half a dozen people on, sort of, on their stomachs with submachine guns were sort of crawling around in the bushes. And I, I thought, this is, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is silly. Um, and then out from behind a sunflower emerged the colonel, you know, in his, in his white. And I thought this, I, so the McDonald view was that he was a, a, a showman. I think he, he confirmed it when we were made to go down to the border with Tunisia with him one afternoon. And he, uh, uh, he was trying to demonstrate that he was improving his relations with Tunisia. And his way of doing that was to get on a JCB uh, forklift truck and to demolish, terribly inefficiently, if I may say so, um, uh, um, a customs post which had been there. The problem was he couldn't drive the thing very well. So with the bit which is supposed to destroy the thing, he kept missing it. And so it, it was quite hilarious. And I, and I thought this was all done for my benefit. And I thought this was quite unnecessary. I had, I had got the, the, the point. I, I, you, 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 you can form impressions of, of people, not so much from what they say, but by observing what they do. And, I, and I, I, I say to you, although it's going to be increasingly difficult in what you do to get to some of these places, you, you, you have to try, to try your best to talk to as many people as you can. And, and get to as many places. Only then do you really know what's happening. I was in the Philippines when Marcus, President Marcus fell. And I was there for about a month and a half. And after that, I thought I began to understand a little bit of what's going on here. I'm not sure I could have done it if I had darted in and out for two days or three days or, 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 or four. It's, it's essential to spend the time working and, 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 and talking to people. I, I had a similar experience. It seems name dropping here, but I, I do, 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 don't mean to, but I did actually remind myself, see, see some of these people. And I, I, before the Iraqi war, I went to see President Bush at the White House, who was, I, I mean, without disclosing too much of my politics, um, his were not mine. I'm not, a, I, I don't have my Republican card in my wallet um, every day. But, uh, um, and, but he was, he had a sort of Texan charm and was, I mean, excessively generous and charming with his time. Didn't like interviews. And so I had a half an hour program and I wanted, a, over long months I'd negotiated a half hour with the president and he would hear none of it. Um, he said, I'll, I can do 15 minutes. And I, you know, I, it's about as long as he can talk to any, any, um, <laughs> any person asking questions to. He, he just doesn't, not that he's not competent, I don't mean that at all. <laughs> You've got the wrong impression. It's just he doesn't like it and he's entitled not to like it. Well, why not? He's President of the United States, he can do what he likes. But he then said that what, what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll give um, Trevor a tour around the White House. And I didn't see the value of that until it, it, the other thing about our trade is you, you can get very sort of tunnel vision. You know, you, you come to do an interview, and the interview is the only thing. Look around and see what else there is around. There are always little bits on the side which might inform, sometimes even better than, than the interview, what, what you're doing. And we did this, this walk around the White House, and it suddenly occurred to me, and all the cameras were following us, and so on. we all mic'd up. And, and, I said, look to me, I must try and make sort of useful conversation. You know, well, you know what, what conversation does one have with the, the President of the United States? And I, so I, I, I thought of one, where I thought it was brilliant, McDonald. You thought of one question, they're really great, yeah? Um, you're doing well. And I, I said, you know, uh, Mr. President, you know, what, what is the, the, the sort of thing you, 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 you think about in moments of crisis? You know, when that phone you know, rings in the, in the middle of the night, you know, what, what do you most think of, you know, and, and, and how do you react, you know, because you are, you know, after all, prominent position in the political universe. And I said, you know, what's your sort of biggest moment of this? What, what, do you, what goes to your mind? And I was expecting, that's the other thing about journalism. You sometimes ask questions, the answers to which you have framed in your own mind. You think, I know exactly what this would say. And if you do that, the, the trick about that is that it helps you to go on to the next question. If you can anticipate the answer, then I was totally wrong. 
he said to me, I, I was expecting something like, you know, uh, I think it was, it, was it Lincoln or Truman who said, the buck stops here. And I was thinking he would say, whenever that phone rings in the middle of the night, I think, my goodness, it must be Moscow. There's a crisis, the hotline, there's trouble somewhere. He said, I learned there's good and evil, and I must be on the side of the good. And for once, I was absolutely, I, I thought, what on earth do I say next? <laughs> because he absolutely flummoxed me uh, um, with, if you like, the brutal simplicity and honesty of, of, of su such an answer. But you, you then knew, uh, I knew the nature of his politics. He was not going to be moved. Very interestingly, he took me into the Oval Office, and I was overawed. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not usually, but uh, <laughs> I'm a pretty ordinary sort of guy. But I, I, you know, to be in the Oval Office with the President of the United States showing you around is absolutely sensational. And I, I thought to myself, you know, if only my mother could see me now. You know, she thought the, the boy hasn't been a total failure. Uh, and and, and uh, and so I, and I, I was, you know, I said to him, and he was a bust of Winston Churchill on thing, which was a gift from the British government. And so I said, you know, Mr. President, it's great to be here. You know, this is the sort of place I could imagine you must have great Middle East summits, you know, about the Israeli-Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, pro problem and how you settle that. And I'd obviously said the wrong thing, you know. I, 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 I mentioned Arafat, and he, he didn't like Arafat. <laughs> And so when I said, you know, this is the sort of place where you might, you know, Arafat and Netanyahu or somebody might, might meet, he said, no. <laughs> I couldn't understand. Somebody said to me, and he said, no, he, he had a bad experience with Arafat. He doesn't like Arafat. So here was a president of the United States who was still subjugating, if you like, his political philosophy to what were sort of personal, personal feelings. Um, and I also felt in that interview that he... There was one point where he, he sort of accused me of, of um, trying to trip him up. Um, but he used very unfortunate words. He said, you are one of those clever journalists who are trying to twist my words. So I have put that on my CV now, you know. The <laughs> President of the United States thinks I'm clever. Nobody else has ever thought that before. But now it must be right, you know, that that, that time. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to make in this roundabout way is that nothing substitutes for actually meeting these these people. Now, um, today's media, n not the sort of easiest place to get into. One of the, 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 the things which happen, let me deal with this in, in, in a sort of serial way. The, the first thing is what I referred to earlier as the sort of multiplicity of channels. And some of them are occasioned by the internet and by the by websites and by the, the, the entire blogosphere. What that means now, really, is not only that people can do with less newspapers, as they are doing in America, big name newspaper in New Orleans, great newspaper called the Times Picayune, uh, which is t turning from an everyday paper to a three day a week. It did sensational work during C Katrina. It was a good paper of great stature. Now it's going to, I gather Newsweek might no longer appear as regularly as it is going to appear online. Um, the, 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 the areas are, are becoming less. But there's another aspect of the this, this sort of blogosphere which I think is, is interesting, which is that people can be their own journalists. You can say, we were talking about it earlier on, about Twitter. You can post what you like on Twitter. And there are people who believe some of this stuff. I mean, I'm sure your stuff is eminent, eminently believable. But, um, uh, but, 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 but it means that views get out there over which there's no kind of old-fashioned journalistic control. You know, the BBC always said, you know, it must, your stuff must be fair. It must be accurate. It must be well-balanced. Well, you can say what you like on that. There is, I spoke to somebody uh, some couple of years ago in the Obama White House who said to me that there's somebody who is charged with getting up every morning at about half past four to make sure they counter what goes on the blogs about the administration and about administration policy. If you don't do it quickly, then it's out there, becomes accepted version of truth, becomes the accepted wisdom, and 
you're a dead man. It's, it's, it's gone. And that's the, and, and, and that's the problem. So it, it means that journalists have to work harder at cultivating their, 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 their sources of information. And you have to work harder because you have now to distinguish what honest and good, well-researched journalism does as against the kind of stuff that appears uh, so frequently on, the, on the, the, the blogosphere. I'd also like to kind of sort of wrap this up by, by, by saying that, referring back to what I said earlier, I, I do believe that despite the difficulties of getting into the business today, because I do think, look, it's always been difficult. But if you really want to do it, you can. If you really want to do it, nothing can stop you. That's always been my view. And I would respectfully submit it should be yours. If I can do it, anybody can. Um, it, it, if you work sufficiently hard at what you want to do and set your goal and uh, you're determined to do it, you can, you can do it. But it brings me to what I wanted to say in summation. We justly, I think, for all the right reasons, praise our system. And we believe fervently, I hope we do, in the freedom of the press. I, I, I love the fact that in America, um, it's called the fourth estate. So it has an establishment in the system. It's, and it echoes the first words in the preamble to the American Constitution, which says, we, the people, that's what it's about, the people. We in the press represent the people. So press freedom, which we praise and which we boast about and which we insist on and about which we are insisting even now in this country because there are various arguments about it, desperately, desperately important. What I don't hear enough about, I think, is about the responsibility which comes with that freedom. I don't think that freedom is an untrammeled quality. All freedoms have their restrictions. Um, I have the privilege of free speech, as do you. You won't be very popular with your colleagues if you shout fire in this room. But it's free speech. But, but you have the responsibility not to do things like shouting fire in a crowded room. Freedom comes with responsibility. Press, press freedom comes with responsibility. Um, because of Leveson and the rest of it, we hear a lot about they must do nothing to impinge or to, to come close to impinging on the freedom of the press. Absolutely right. But what do we do when the press um, strays into illegal areas? And I think that is the question. So nothing comes for free. You can't just you know, preach freedom of the press and be irresponsible in what you do. I do like the old BBC things about you know, being fair, being accurate, and being well balanced. That's, there's, there's, there's no other way. Uh, it, it's, we have newspapers, and we, we, we know where their political allegiances lie, and so we can we can treat with them. As, as journalists, one-to-one, -one, and as people reporting facts, that you have to report honestly what you, what, what you find. You, you, you may get it wrong, but you can't stray into illegality. In other words, what I'm saying is that you can't um, hack into Millie Dowler's telephone and, and expect to get away with it. That's my view. Um, um, so it may be very unpopular, but I'm now old enough to take it. <laughs> um, it's, I think what you're trying to do in your lives in, in, in your, uh, after college is a, is a very venerable part of a very, very venerable institution. Um, it's not easy, but it's fascinating. It's, I think, the thing which gives you a, a kind of informed view of the world. I think it makes you a richer person, intellectually, um, in some cases morally. 
I think it is part of the very fabric of the life that we so value. And I am, I think I've been very lucky to, to have done what I have done, and I, I hope that you are too. Thank you. As you all know, I was um, tweeting and I've asked um, students to submit questions via Twitter. So I'm going to kick off with the one. Is Kerry here? Kerry, hey! Do you want to ask your question instead of me? Oh, the question was um, what's your secret to longevity in the industry? Oh, luck. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I. I I'll go just slightly against what I said earlier. It, it, I, I think it's, I said you must set a goal and go for it, but I, I think it does help if you can kind of turn your hand to a variety of things. Um, when I started off as a journalist, I never ever thought that I would um, end up reading the news. But I, somebody, you know, thought maybe I should. and. Um, I said I did some sport, I did industrial reporting. What I loved was international political reporting, which was what I did at, 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 at school, and, and that is what I wanted to do. But I don't think it's a bad idea to have a few strings to, to, to your bow. Um, I think the great problem in life is when you, are, you, you become very one-dimensional. All bureaucracies have this lovely habit. They, they love to discover what we are in a kind of one-word sentence. And then they this, uh, put the sentence across a box, and they shut the box, and they shut you in there. Um, if you do a variety of things, then you provide them with a little bit of a problem in categorizing who you are and what you can do. Or, to be more positive about it, you demonstrate that you can do a variety of things reasonably well. I think that's a very Im Im important bit. And I just add one other thing, which is, and I, I don't need to tell you guys this because you've been through college here and you know it by your own experience. There's no substitute in the world for hard work. Only bit they can't take away from you. Um, my son, when he went off to college, his headmaster said, said to him, he said, you know, they're going to be at university, all these guys who you'll see at three or four in the morning in the bar, and do you think they do not work? They go back and they work till seven or eight in the morning. Um, there's no substitute for hard work, none. none. You, you know, they, 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 I, I say this because they, 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 you know, in, 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 in English life, you know, there's a tendency to say, oh, do you know old John there? You know, his father left him half a million dollars and it's a part of a country estate. Forget it. Doesn't happen. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you get what you do. Now, maybe there's some of you here with the country estates. I don't know. But, um, uh, it, it, my experience is that it all comes through graft. There's nothing else. That's, that's where you get it. Hard work. I'm going to open out to the rest of the floor. Thank you. Does any of you have any questions at the top? Oh, yes. I make a brief appearance yeah. in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, you, 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 I mean, you, you do. I mean, there is a sense in which you do feel, you do feel involved. But I mean, I think what, what it does, it, it promotes this zeal to try and understand much more closely what's going on and to try to represent it, 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 it fairly. Because, I mean, these things are very complicated. I cannot tell you how difficult it was for me to understand Northern Ireland. You know, 
why, the, why on earth would somebody plant a bomb under a Land Rover? Like, you, you know, and and, and to, to get to the genesis of that, you know, the so-called troubles, that great euphemism for what was going on in Ireland for many years. Um, but you have to work at it. And, and after you do, you do feel, you know, that you are really privileged to be part of that. I, I remember that, that summit meeting in, 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 in well, Brussels, where it Strasbourg, wherever it was, where Mrs. Thatcher had lost the vote. And, uh, um, well, she hadn't lost it, but she hadn't won as many as she thought. And actually, she was in the wrong place, you know. She, she, but, but she was convinced that she wanted to stride across the international stage and perhaps forgot that uh, she needed a few votes back at home. But, um, um, throughout your career, obviously, you've seen how people connect with the news. Where do you see the future of journalism going, especially print journalism? Yeah, well, I, I, um, I hope it, it, it continues to, 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 to flourish, but it's going through difficult times. And I occasionally get glimpses of, of real hope. I, I happen to read a lot of American papers. I, I love the New York Times. I, um, and I would also say to you, you know, read as great a variety of things as you can. Because as I hinted earlier, no, no one person has the absolute guarantee on truth and integrity and honesty and fair reporting. So read, read as much as you can. And I, I read New York Times. And I, I, I read something today in, in <laughs> one of the issues in New York Times that um, Mark Thompson, who is the director general of the BBC, when all the Jimmy Savile stuff was going on, has now gone over to be chief executive of the New York Times. There's a journalist on the New York Times who's written a damning piece about his new boss. Now that's, that's journalism. That's, that's, you, you, I mean, you know, one of the columnists has written a piece, and I can't believe our new boss didn't know what was going on at the BBC. How can he say that? And, and this was published in the New York Times. Great, I thought. So I look at those as flashes of brilliance and you know, bright lights of hope for that business of print journalism. I am one of those bores who l loves the feel of newspapers. I, I, love, I love books. I love turning magazine pages. Um, I think Kindle is great, really, for, for all the things it can give you, because frequently on holidays, I run out of reading material. But, and, and you can stack as many things on that as... But I love the feel of pages. I love, the, I love books. And I hope that that love uh, um, um, permeates and continues um, print journalism forever. Okay, we've got time for one more. In front. Uh, my question was, since you've begun out in industry, what struggles have you faced since you first started out? And how did you accomplish them as you worked through your career? Struggles in what way? One of the um, one of the things about the it's it's a very good question. One of the things about the television industry is that you, you well you can't actually hide behind the camera, but that people become so I interested in the image of, of of what you do that they after a while forget who you are. But there were people who phoned up and said to ITN, "Why are you employing this black guy? You know who the hell is he?" And um, but they. They, they stuck by me. Um, to pretend that that doesn't happen is untrue. Much, much less now. Much, much less now. I mean, this, I don't know, I live not very far from here near Richmond Park. And you sort of walk down the street and uh, the, 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 the variety of languages I hear. Sometimes I walk down and I can hardly, there's hardly a word of English. I wonder, where, where am I? Um, <laughs> we, 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 we are now gloriously uh, one of the most multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious communities anywhere. London, in that sense, is a paradise of this sort of stuff. So all the old verities about who people are and who, what they might do, I think, are changing. Um, but the other part of your question, f forgetting the racial bit or the, uh, about the, 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 is, is really to work hard enough to make to make a name for yourself. I, I, I'm 
rather boring about that. I, you, you know, I, I've always work, worked hard. And if you do, you can manage to sort of stand out and, and, and to gain success. But that, that's, it's not a very good answer, but that's the only way I know to do it. It's the only way how. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sir Trevor. That was amazing. I think everyone again...